All right, maybe um, we'll get started. Welcome everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is uh, Ina Shadala. I'm the Director of Learning and Partnerships at PFC, Philanthropic Foundations Canada. Um, for those who do not know, PFC is a member association of private and public foundations mainly, um, all across Canada. So today's webinar will focus on the diversity, equity and inclusion lens in philanthropy and why it is so important right now, more than ever, and why it should really stay that way uh, when we're thinking about philanthropy in Canada. I'm joined by an amazing panel today uh, and by my colleague Jean-Cyl Bruyère, our Director of Communications and Policy, who will be co-moderating uh, the webinar with me. Hi, Jean-Cyl. So, um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. I want to make sure that everyone um, understands the, the way we're going to operate. Uh, if you have any questions during the discussions at any time, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom center of your screen. And we will try to answer as much as possible during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Also to inform um, all the participants as well as the pan panelists that th this webinar is going to be um, is being recorded and um, that at the end of the webinar, you will receive a short survey uh, from PFC uh, about the webinar and uh, as well as the recording and some complementary resources uh, that could be useful uh, for your work. So perhaps uh, I'll try to, first of all, introduce the amazing panel, panel that we have today and I'll start with Sarah. Um, Sarah Gemma is a com community organizer from Hamilton, Ontario. She is the co-founder of the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, an organization committed to building the political and community power of people with disabilities. Hi, Sarah, and thank you for taking the time from your very busy schedule to be with us today. Um, Anifa Kassam. Uh, has extensive experience building and leading collaborative efforts that drive, foster, and support community. Hanifa has served uh, on the board of directors of the Laidlaw Foundation and was the president of the foundation from 2015 to 2018. Uh, most recently, Hanifa collaborated with us, with BFC, um, in all of our work um, on the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion in Canadian philanthropy. Hi, Hanifa. John. Hi, John. John Waitzer uh, is passionate about contributing to a renewed philanthropic sector. They currently organize with the Resource Movement, the Edge Funders Alliance, and the Next Gen Philanthropy Collaborative. And we've worked uh, a lot in the past with uh, John, in particular um, on the Youth and Conference uh, at the PFC um, Annual Conference. Hi, John. Last but not least, Adam Seifer. Um, Adam Seifer is a postdoctoral researcher with Philab, where he studies the possibilities and limitations of DI philanthropy as a framework to fight for social and economic justice. Hi, Adam, and thank you for taking the time to speak in this webinar. So um, just some context setting before we get started with our conversation with the panelists. Um, it is quite obvious that the current crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, is highlighting now more than ever existing inequalities in Canada and internationally as well. And we, we are uh, noticing that there is a need for foundations like never before to be nimbler and to respond effectively to rapidly changing and urgent needs. And so currently foundations are grappling with how not, to not only respond quickly, but to think critically about how they can ensure these responses are intentional with a long-term vision um, to create a more resilient Canada. And PFC together with other uh, infrastructure organizations such as Community Foundations Canada, EFC, and the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada have worked together to develop five guiding principles for supporting uh, grantees in this time of crisis. And I really invite you to take a look at these principles uh, if you haven't done so already as they are very helpful in this time. So um, just as a refresher for, for um, with Anifa Kassam, who's one of our panelists, we have worked um, extensively to develop some tools and resources about diversity, equity and inclusion um, for Canadian philanthropy. 
And we had landed on a working definition of DEI uh, to guide um, uh, our work and to help foundations really take into account uh, the DEI perspective into their grant making, but as into in, in their governance as well. So as a reminder, um, diversity includes all the ways in which people differ encompassing the different characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. Diversity is really about broadening that definition of what it means to be human. Um, equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. Finally, inclusion is the act of creating environments in which any individual or group feels heard. Um, I just wanted to quote uh, a colleague uh, from uh, the Inspirit Foundation, Mohamed Uk, who uh, once said that diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. So I just wanted to share, and we'll share the links uh, after the webinar um, on these, um, uh, resources that uh, we developed with Juniper Glass, um, as well as Anifa Kassam uh, on gender lens philanthropy, um, uh, sort of a practical guide to help you in your work, as well as the toolkit on governance and grant making to support you in approaching the questions related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Finally, I, because I, I know it resonates with foundations when we talk about impact, um, I just wanted to underline very quickly the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in impact um, and how the combination of diverse perspectives, um, um, equi um, being equitable and inclusive really leads to more positive uh, impact. So uh, without further ado, I, I'm just going to turn uh, the time over to our great panelists. Um, and I'll start with Sarah with the first question. Um, so Sarah, in your own perspective, at both a systemic and human scale, what do you think the COVID-19 crisis highlights? Um, I think the COVID-19 crisis highlights a lot of different issues, but for me and for the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, what we're mainly focused on and what we're really worried about is the lack of conversation around what it means to protect people with disabilities who are vulnerable uh, to not only the virus, but to uh, living in low income situations, um, struggling to access employment or food and things like that. We're very interested in this idea that COVID is impacting a lot of long term care homes and a lot of people with disabilities. And yet, in the very same breath, the province of Ontario released a draft triage protocol on March 28th. 2020, um, prioritizing and listing um, who would get a ventilator um, if we were to run out as a province and people with disabilities were on the bottom of that list and they had no qualms with that. Um, so we're very focused on this idea that in order to create a society that is equal and just and fair for everybody, we have to prioritize the most vulnerable and that means people who don't fit the standard mode of what productivity may look like, right? People who don't contribute back to the economy in the same way that everybody else can or does. And knowing that it's okay, that your life has value, whether or not you can be productive in the way that this capitalist society demands, right? Um, and we're seeing through the response to COVID-19, the ways in which that's not true, the ways in which people are being prioritized if they're able-bodied, able um, if they're younger. We're seeing the ways in which the the province has declared that they're going to claw back people who are living on social assistance and who applied for CERB, um, knowing that social assistance is already below their poverty line and ODSP is not enough to get by with rent and food and all the costs. Uh, so in Hamilton, um, some of the issues that we're seeing is a lot of people with mental health concerns with disabilities are being carded by bylaw officers who are walking around because they have nowhere else to go. And Hamilton has the largest density of people with disabilities in the province. And so some of the things we're worried about is how can we live in a society that is pushing for equity and inclusion, but people with disabilities are never in 
centered within that. And the thing about this conversation is every single one of us will be disabled at some point in our lifetimes. It's not something that you can avoid. Every single one of us will be um, moving toward old age. And what will it look like to build a society that fits us, that doesn't discard us because of the ways our bodies function? And so these are some of the issues that we're sort of noticing here in Hamilton. Thank you, Sarah. Um, such uh, w wise words and, and really inspiring because, I mean, the fact that you just said that every one of us uh, will be disabled at some point, I think that's a very uh, important point that pushes you to think more broadly when you're thinking about, you know, how to respond to, to, to this crisis. Um, Hanifa, same question, uh, in your own perspective, uh, you know, what do you think the COVID-19 crisis is highlighting currently in Canada? Sure, so to jump on Sarah's point, I think um, something that I'm taking from what is going on in response to COVID is that not all Canadians are experiencing COVID in the same way. And so when I try to think about some um, frameworks to better understand that, two in particular come to mind. The first is that people are experiencing COVID as it is as it relates to their experience and their access to our social determinants of health. And our social determinants of health include income and social status, employment and working conditions, education and literacy, childhood experience, physical environments, social supports and coping skills, healthy behaviors, access to health services, biology and genetic endowment, gender, culture, race, and racism. It's also connected to their ability to attain their highest level of health. What I mean by that is their health equity. And to put this into context, we can look at a few simplified examples of what I mean by this. And so referring to some of the actions that both our provincial and federal governments have taken in relation to economic impact of COVID and those that have been affected by COVID is while well, we've seen a number of programs been put out by our governments related to unemployment benefits, they're typically far less than wages. And for so many Canadians, in particular those who work in the accommodations or food industry sector, they're simply not enough. More than this, jobs in these sectors are disproportionately held by those living in poverty younger people, newcomers, and racialized populations. And so when we put those two together, what we're seeing is that it's these communities, these individuals who cannot afford to live off CERB, uh, maintain the ones that continue to work and continue to be affected by COVID in ways that other particular segments of our population are not. Another example is related to our provincial and municipal emergency measures that have been put in place to keep all Canadians healthy and safe. While social distancing measures are keeping many of us home and safe, they, the experience that Black, Indigenous, and other communities of colour are having because of these measures means that these folks are experiencing higher proportions of racism, racial profiling, and criminalization of poverty, as Sarah alluded to in her earlier comments. More than this, staying at home increases the expenses of the poor while decreasing the expenses of middle class and higher earning income, income brackets. And so to put this more specifically, the poor miss out on the food banks, the meals, the resources while higher income saves on gas and other home related activities that they're able to have access to now. My last example is related to the hard work and the res rapid response that the nonprofit sector and the community sector have been championing over the last five weeks. As the nonprofit and community sector continue to operate at 150%, these sectors will be required to make difficult decisions in the near future. Many small and medium sized organizations operate with less than three months of reserve on hand. Organizations that focus on meeting the specific needs of Black, Indigenous, and people of color are often smaller and have less resources. With these challenges ahead, organizations who are effectively working to support those who will be and are most affected by COVID 
will continue to be thought of first when we think about how we address and respond to COVID. So I point out these examples, not just to illustrate how they're not working, but also to commend those that have been involved in moving these actions forward, but also to acknowledge that there's still more work to be done, that there are still numbers of and thousands of folks across our country that are not being supported in the way that they need to be and equitably as we move forward in our response to COVID. And it will take all of us to work together to be able to achieve that. Thank you, Anifa. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, move with, uh, with John. John, in your perspective, um, what, what do you think you know, the crisis is actually highlighting? What, do, what, what would you like us to really think about? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Hanifa and Sarah, for that like super helpful big picture systems overview. Um, I think that I I'm coming to this session as someone who participates in philanthropy through, through my family's access to wealth. Um, and so I'm going to share reflections on what I think is being highlighted about this particular system of philanthropy that, that I'm very much a part of to, to build on the really powerful sort of stage setting that, that the two of you have just offered. Um, I think that for philanthropy, like other sectors, this, this highlights both where our systems are, are causing harm and also just how capable we are of rapid and radical change. And so I want to celebrate how funders are stretching beyond business as usual in exciting and inspiring ways, like relaxing grant requirements, creating rapid response funds, more and more. Um, I think that someone who captured this really well is Jessica Bolduc, who's the, the director of the 4Rs Youth Movement, um, and who I also have the pleasure of collaborating with as part of the Next Gen Philanthropy Collaborative. She said that one of the most powerful things that we're witnessing during this moment is the bravery and innovation coming from inspiring folks, building community across difference and transforming previously unmalleable systems each and every day, showing each other together that we're making the impossible things possible. Um, and meanwhile, I think we're also seeing the parts of our systems that still feel rigid and unmalleable. And so for philanthropy, I think that so far many grassroots and uh, groups and social movement groups have been locked out of philanthropy's response to this crisis, just like they were mostly locked out of our resources in the before times. Um, so, you know, rapid response funds and mutual aid groups like the Disability Justice Network of Ontario that Sarah leads, um, and like uh, Solidar Solidarité Sans Frontières, Solidarity Across Borders that are addressing the needs of the most marginalized directly. Um, also the visionary movement building groups like the Migrant Rights Network, like Indigenous Climate Action um, that are not qualified donees. Um, and so I think the most rigid barriers that I'm seeing that remain unmalleable are around three things, are around risk, trust, and power in our, in our system. Um, so I think that in terms of risk, some foundations are still worried about maintaining assets and so are not increasing their giving right now because of financial market concerns. Uh, I think that many groups closest to the front lines of crisis and doing the most essential movement work are not qualified donees, not charities. And so many foundations are hesitant to embrace the, the risk of funding these groups out of regulatory concerns. And I think that in both cases, we need a major reality check around the difference between the risks that we face as foundations and the, the actual life and death risks at, uh, within marginalized communities. Um, in terms of trust, I actually think that this was summed up really well by Justin Weeb from Mastercard Foundation, who's also a member of the Next Gen Philanthropy Collaborative, who named on a panel recently that we need to acknowledge that foundations have a spotty track record of both offering trust and earning trust. And I think that this needs to mean that we push ourselves to extend our own trust wider. And also we push ourselves to recognize that having not earned trust means there are limits to the appropriate roles for us to play. So we need to extend our trust to groups working on both survival and social transformation within marginalized communities that we're not already in relationship with. And we need to recognize where we haven't built the trust to partner with some communities in supporting the groups that have done this. And then lastly, I would say, I'm gonna say more about power later, but uh, for now, I just wanna share this quote from Vu Le from Nonprofit AF and let it stand on its own. I think it's really powerful. Um, yes. The lessons that we are all in this together and that our lives are interconnected and that inequality hurts all of us and not just the marginalized, those are all great. But they're actually dangerous if we use them to continue to be in denial of a much more critical lesson. The only way we can make a dent in social justice is if progressive nonprofits and foundations get over our disdain of politics and power and fully embrace using it to change unjust systems. So. I think I'll leave it at that for now and then come back into the, the how-to later on. 
very powerful. Um, yeah, so, so really this crisis is highlighting the need, I guess, to um, take more risks. Yes, did you forget something? <laughs> I forgot something, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I just, I wanted to end on a hopeful note, <laughs> which, was, which was that um, before we feel defeated by, by these remaining barriers, I think that another lesson or reminder that, that feels important to name is that even in a crisis, radical change still often happens in steps. Um, mm -hmm. And so even when we come up against what feels like the farthest we can reach in shifting these unmalleable systems, um, a few moments later in this crisis, it can suddenly feel possible to go even further. And, and I think even just looking at the example of the CERB, where it's, you know, it's been gradually expanded, thanks in large part to the tireless advocacy of the very social movement groups that we generally do such a bad, bad job funding, but, but who, are, who are pushing you know, day by day to expand the range of the possible, not just all in one shot. Great. Thank you, John. Um, perhaps maybe uh, later on in the second question, um, you'll have the chance to elaborate a little bit more about how to actually support those, um, those movements. Um, and, uh, and so now I wanted to hear about from a, a researcher <laughs> who has um, some distance from, you know, uh, what is happening now and so, sort of a critical eye. And I, I will give the floor to Adam to, to say a few words about uh, what the current crisis is actually highlighting and what he has observed until now. Uh, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Is my mic working? <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, first off, I just want to thank uh, uh, Sarah, Hanifa, and John for bringing up some really, really great points. I don't want to uh, repeat what they're saying, so I'll sort of try and build off it and, and put on my researcher hat and, and try my best to speak from that perspective. Um, so the first thing that, uh, that the crisis has, has revealed, uh, which the other speakers have brought up as well, is um, how COVID-19 is functioning as, uh, as a mirror of sorts that's reflecting in, in frightening detail uh, the social, economic, and political uh, inequities that already structure uh, Canadian society. So what it's doing, it's, it's revealing the importance of race and gender, sexuality, disability, immigration status, for example, uh, in shaping all areas and institutions in Canadian society. Um, so if we look at a few different examples, we can look at uh, the issue of work and labor, which is, is so important right now. Um, and then we need to ask questions such as, uh, which groups uh, of people are working on the front lines uh, in grocery stores and in care work, uh, in jobs without access to paid sick leave? And then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, which communities are in professions that allow them to work from home? Or if we look at the education and, and the, the state of education right now, both uh, in, in universities and colleges, but also in high schools and elementary schools, and, and the push towards doing some sort of distance education, uh, student, uh, which students from which communities have uh, access to the technology for distance education, which students have a quiet space in their home to do schoolwork while their entire families are at home as well. Um, you know, we can turn to health, which uh, Hanif already brought up, when, and we need to look at which communities are at higher risk of suffering from COVID-19 and other respiratory issues, and why is that the case? Or we can look at the uh, incarceration in COVID-19, which is a, a, its own crisis, uh, and look at who is overrepresented in the criminal justice system and why this is the case. Um, what's key throughout these is, is making sure to look at how um, all these different uh, markers of identity or these axes of uh, oppression, uh, they, they, they intersect uh, and shape all these uh, key institutions in our society. Uh, I mean, even, even the other day, I came across a thread on Twitter uh, where uh, it, was a, it was an academic and she was talking, she, she's um, the editor of a, of a fairly large political science uh, journal. And she was talking about how uh, during COVID-19, the rate of submission for articles, for new articles has actually increased, but nearly all of those submissions are coming from male academics. And you have to ask why this is the case. And that's because care work and domestic labor and invisible labor is being dis you know, disproportionately put on, on female academics. So even in, in a case like that, COVID-19 is, is sort of uh, a mirror that, uh, or, or exacerbating these, these existing uh, inequities. A second point I wanted to bring up was, uh, which um, John touched on as well, but uh, actually all of the speakers have touched on as well, is how COVID-19 has highlighted uh, the limitations and gaps in the systems and institutions that are meant to help those most in need. So on the one hand, as we see uh, the federal government stepping up to bolster the social safety net, 
um, through CERB, for instance. Uh, it's also at the same time revealing the serious gaps that we have in our social safety net. Um, likewise, as the philanthropic and charitable sector is fighting to install emergency measures and flexible relations with grantees, it's simultaneously revealing the limitations and barriers that exist in the current sector. And that what that gets me thinking about uh, is that these changes are being framed as being necessary in a time of crisis. I mean, even this entire webinar is framed around this idea of crisis. But for vulnerable communities, COVID-19 is exacerbating a crisis that was already there and is perpetually there and is part of the fabric of Canadian society. Um, and so uh, related to that, uh, my third point is that COVID-19 has also highlighted what is possible and what a more humane society would look like. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about how during crises, there's always this rush to institute more progressive policies or social democratic policies. And suddenly we're able to see what a more humane society might look like. Uh, for instance, as I said, we're bolstering, uh, the government's bolstering unemployment supports, addressing gaps in government supports that target populations that are typically ignored by business as usual uh, policies. So extension of benefits to temporary foreign workers or uh, youth and part-time workers. And then on the other side, you have, you know, for instance, the use of empty buildings to house people who are experiencing homelessness. So suddenly you have suddenly people are finding it unacceptable for people to live uh, on the streets every night while there are heated and safe buildings that sort of sit empty. So we have this idea that we, we have to put in all these new policies during this time of crisis, but it's I, all, all I can think about is how for the, the communities we're talking about right now, the crisis is perpetual. There was a crisis beforehand. It's exacerbated in some ways, but this we need to think about um, these issues in terms of a crisis that exists before and will continue on. Uh, after COVID-19. Um, yeah, so those are sort of my, my three main points. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, and, and, and actually, uh, I guess one of the objectives and um, that we wanted to, um, to reach through this uh, conversation is really how um, these changes in behavior um, that are uh, being um, uh, pushed uh, you know, in times of crisis or, you know, the, a lot of funders, we see them, uh, for example, making um, their granting requirements a lot more flexible and all of these different approaches that funders are taking. And how can we, th how can we actually make that perhaps more sustainable or, you know, and how can we um, learn the lessons from, from this crisis to, to make some changes uh, for, for, for the future? And so, Adam, uh, I'll continue with you, actually, in thinking about this, thinking about, about um, you know, the short and long-term uh, uh, perspectives. What would you, um, uh, what are the type of recommendations that you would share with funders um, uh, in light of this crisis, or perhaps for the short-term and for the long-term? Uh, okay, so, uh... I hope I'm not repeating myself too much now because uh, I'm answering both questions back to back. But um, I guess the first thing, again, I just really want to emphasize that for vulnerable communities, the time of crisis preceded COVID-19 and these communities will continue to live in a time of crisis after COVID-19. So in that sense, the main recommendation I'm going to make is that uh, any points that I will make and any points that the other speakers make during this panel around funders and times of crisis should be applied beyond COVID-19. That's like my main recommendation, right? So, you know, the crisis of youth homelessness or racialized poverty or indigenous and black incarceration, for example, they're going to continue after, right? So as we talk about, uh, you know, flexibility and urgency and experimentation that funders and government need to display in the moment, uh, as Inez said before, this should become the new normal, or at least we should have a conversation about that. Um, beyond that, uh, I think there's an, uh, not only a need to uh, um, uh, implement uh, or like um, bolster our DEI efforts right now, but I think there's, uh, we need to make a key switch from moving beyond DEI as a sort of funding category uh, towards uh, DEI as, as a lens or a guiding philosophy, right? Um, so we can't uh, approach DEI as a set of plug and play policies. Uh, instead, in this moment, we need to think deeply about how a DEI lens uh, can reveal the complex and often invisible ways in which race and gender and sexual orientation and disability uh, shape all manifestations of this crisis as well as future crisis. Um, so the question then becomes, what does DEI as a lens of our guiding philosophy look like uh, during COVID-19? Um, 
And uh, I think there's, there's three sort of areas where uh, it's important to address that. So within the foundation, the mainstream perspective on DEI usually focuses on foundation composition. So for example, board makeup, uh, staff, et cetera. And I think shifting to a DEI lens uh, would put more of an emphasis in addition to that, but also on ideas. So in other words, it's not only about diverse identities, but also about non-dominant ideas and perspectives and, and knowledge bases as well. Um, so how can we uh, include uh, ideas and knowledges and perspectives that come from grassroots community actors and grassroots political actors? Um, and so this would mean uh, reaching out to community organizers and actors that are doing the work on the ground in order to elevate those perspectives and knowledge bases uh, or the perspectives and knowledge bases of those most impacted by COVID-19. Uh, the second aspect of DEI um, within uh, the foundation uh, ecosystem, I guess, is the, the who of grant making. So who is being uh, given grants? And again, the mainstream perspective is, is in, to increase funding for uh, diverse, I'm putting that in quotes because there's problems with that sort of concept, that uh, way of framing it, but diverse communities and diverse grantee organizations. Um, and shifting to a DEI lens would do that, yes, but again, it cannot be framed solely as a numbers game. Right? It cannot be DEI as a funding category. So it needs to involve grant making relationships with organizations and groups that prioritize equity and social justice and are, and are experiencing the urgency of this crisis firsthand. So there needs to be a conscious effort again to elevate the ideas and perspectives of grassroots organizers working in communities that are identified as being diverse. Um, and the, fall, uh, the, the third aspect of switching to a DEI lens uh, focuses on uh, DEI as a goal of grant making. Um, and the E is the most important part there, I think. So it's grant making in pursuit of a more equitable society. Um, and so on the one hand, and I think this is something John will probably speak about soon, but figuring out innovative ways to channel resources to a grassroots organization. But it's also, again, looking to grassroots organizers as the experts and internalizing this um, democratization of ideas beyond COVID-19 as well. Um, Grant making should be done in pursuit of uh, providing legitimacy to the perspectives, methods, and insights of grassroots community actors. Um, grassroots groups and equity-seeking nonprofits, they're constantly in the struggle for legitimacy in the eyes of funders and government and the public. And so at this moment, it's really important that funders not only channel their resources to this group, but they use their powered resources to, try to help legitimize grassroots knowledge, perspectives, and approaches um, as well as the knowledge, perspectives, and approaches of, of marginalized groups as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, so perhaps I, I will actually um, uh, ask John the same question um, to about those two or three recommendations or key ideas that you would like to convey to, to funders participating in this call and beyond because it is being recorded and so uh, a lot of, of more of our foundations are going to be listening to this. What would those be? Sure. Um, so I think I want to come back to rethinking our relationships to risk, trust, and power in order to move resources and build capacity at the grassroots within marginalized communities. Um, and so I guess the question is, how do I think we should do that? Um, in terms of risk and trust, I think we need to increase our giving during this time, both to groups we already know and to grassroots groups that we're not yet connected with. And so I think that means to make it not an either or thing, we need to be ready to reduce our endowments. Um, and I think that uh, we need to be supporting grassroots groups specifically with, within communities that have been most impacted by the crisis. And often those are the communities that are most excluded from existing support programs. And in order to do that, I think we need to be ready to fund both groups that uh, have access to uh, a charitable number um, and also groups that don't have access, so non-qualified donees. Um, and, and I think that we need to be ready to recognize again in terms of trust here, uh, when we might not be the right ones to build a direct partnership and following guidance around working with intermediaries who have earned that trust more. Um, and I mean, we have one of those intermediaries on, on this panel, right? Uh, Sarah and the DGNO are running the Hamilton Cameron Green Collective and doing amazing work at the grassroots that prioritizes equity as part of the work. And there's a lot more. So I, I wanna share two other examples. Um, so, you know, not everyone, for example, is positioned 
to operate a rapid response fund for Indigenous youth in a good way. And that's clearly something that resources need to be going towards. And so how lucky are we as a sector that the Ontario Indigenous Youth Partnership Program uh, is already doing this and we can just support them. They have those relationships. They're already anchored in that community. They, they were able to just pivot quickly and offer direct rapid response relief. Um, similarly for sex workers, they're often systematically excluded from government relief programs right now. Um, and, and this is also a community that's been deeply harmed by well-meaning people intervening from a place of privilege, which is you know, sort of the definition of philanthropy in many ways. So it's understandable that they don't trust philanthropy very much. Luckily, uh, Maggie's and Butterfly, two organizations have partnered up, Butterfly being a non-qualified donee, Maggie's being a charity, and they've built the infrastructure for a rapid response relief fund for sex workers. So we can just support them. Um, I think another big thing for us to think about, and this is actually something I'm really guilty of myself, especially, is I think we need to commit to overcome our biases as a, as a sector towards groups that are in urban centers. Um, and we need to find ways to support marginalized groups in rural and indigenous communities. Um, notably, I haven't really had examples of those groups here, so <laughs> I think it's, it's like a really important thing to name. And, and once again, supporting groups outside urban centers, it becomes all the more important to figure out how to partner with non-qualified donees to get to those grassroots. Um, I think another thing is that we really need to push ourselves to simplify our processes. So recognizing the strength of our biases towards creating processes that are geared to our own comfort, like really asking ourselves, what's the actual closest we can get to just giving money to groups at the front lines and trusting them to use it well? And, and, and like, can we just do that? I think in some cases we really can. Um, and, and so one, ex one exception is that when partnering with, with non-qualified donees, non-charities, we can't do that. There are, there are regulations around direction and control that we need to follow. And Jihad uh, from Laidlaw Foundation, thank you for raising this in the chat. Um, but I really think that we, we can push ourselves much further than we, than we often do around testing the envelope of, of what's been considered appropriate. Um, and there are foundations like Laidlaw that have been leaders in this for a while. And I happen to know that PFC and FeeLab will be creating resources around how members of the philanthropic community can, can work with non-qualified donees more directly um, to build on foundational work done by the Next Gen Philanthropy Collaborative. Um, to come back to our, our relationship to power, uh, I think we need to focus our resources on groups that are building power within marginalized communities. So when funding uh, relief efforts, we need to prioritize groups that are led by members of the community being supported and also that bring a political analysis to the relief work. Um, the, the Black Panthers offered some of the clearest articulation around the connection between meeting basic needs and building political power. So here I actually also want to shout out to Black Lives Matter Toronto's Black Emergency Response Fund, which is a great example of this. Um, and then I think we need to fund movement building work in addition to relief work. Again, not either or, reach deep, spend down. Um, I think there's at least two reasons for this. One is that crises can either be very politicizing or very depoliticizing. And we have a responsibility to support groups within marginalized communities that are working to bring attention to the root causes of this crisis. And then second is that even in the short term, movement groups play an essential role in determining what relief measures actually look like among the huge range of potential responses. So again, thinking about the CERB and the expansion of those benefits thanks to groups like the Mig Migrant Rights Network, Workers Action Center, et cetera. Um, and I'm running out of time, I know, but I, I wanna share one last thought, which is that in, in pushing ourselves to expand our horizons of what's, po what's possible, I think we make, need to make sure that we reflect on our own institutions as well. Um, and so we need to remember the fundamental truth that philanthropic wealth has been largely accumulated through stolen land, stolen lives, stolen labor. And if we wanna meet this moment in a way that seizes the opportunity to create a better world after the crisis, I think we need to embrace a vision of philanthropy in which our institutions are not led by people who come from that lineage of wealth accumulation. And, and I think this can start with things like participatory grant making, having specific decisions that are made by members of directly impacted communities. But I think it really needs to progress towards the institutions themselves being led by people from the communities they serve. And so I think that as part of our response to this crisis, we need to get excited ultimately about abolishing uh, settler creative philanthropy. So thank you to the circle on philanthropy and Aboriginal peoples for distinguishing between settler creative philanthropy and other forms of philanthropy that actually do resemble mutual aid. But I think that we need to abolish settler creative philanthropy from the inside to create organizations that are in service of mutual aid rather than elite generosity. Thank you, John. Um, so Anifa, um, based on your experience and collaboration with, um, uh, with Laidlaw and uh, having 
done a lot of the work that um, uh, PFC has shared in terms of, you know, developing resources. Um, the survey um, that we um, shared in, in, in 2018 um, and on your conversations with funders, um, what would the, those two or three recommendations be um, at this stage of, of the process? So I find um, Adam and John's point to be really progressive, having been involved with what we've learned about how foundations, or many foundations, not all foundations, currently interact with understanding and employing DEI practices. And so the challenge for me and the recommendations that I would like to see foundations adopt is that I don't actually think that um, we have enough experience in doing what we need to do well and fast to be able to contribute to responding to COVID and the other challenges of equity seeking groups effectively. The opportunity here though is that we're in a space where that tension, I hope for many institutions gets thrown out the door and that the opportunity then both in the short and long term is what folks take up. And so for example, um, John's point around doing away with the institutional structures that limit our ability to resource grassroots or unincorporated group rather than seeing it as an obstacle and to see it as how do we get around to this to make sure that we're both operating in a fiscally responsible way but at the same time we're making sure that we're fully embracing our mission as public service publicly serving organizations in terms of what does this look like or what could this look like in the short term? I think Adam and John have really done a good job of highlighting some of those most immediate next steps. Where I hope to add some additional um, information is around the long term and that foundations have a unique opportunity right now to not only react to the short term crisis that we're experiencing, but also to start to look around the curve start to understand what will be the fallout from COVID once we begin to move into recovery and how can we use our resources to begin to be a part of our movement around building a new and more inclusive economy post COVID. And while resources um, and capital that foundations are using to deploy emergency resources are going down, most foundations have been built to be around in perpetuity. So you'll make your money back. Just wait. You know, foundations have had a really successful last 10 years. I think now is not the time to worry about how are we protecting our endowment. Now is the time to figure out how do we respond to the urgency of those who are experiencing such struggle and difficulty in getting from day to day in terms of what else that looks like when we think about the long term, and this was highlighted earlier, it's about investing in the systems change work. It's investing in the people who are closest to the ground, not only with resources, but in terms of ensuring that those organizations, those communities have leaders to move their needs forward. It's not about investing in the larger institutions that are predominantly led by white men. Um, it's about ensuring that our organizations that are addressing the needs of equity seeking groups are led and staffed by those people as well. And so investing in advocacy, investing in the leadership of equity seeking groups is instrumental as we think about what does this mean for philanthropy moving forward. Another area I would highlight right now, which sometimes we do immensely well, other times we don't, is around data collection and impact. And while the word impact is something that most, if not all, institutions are gravitating towards and have been gravitating towards, our ability to demonstrate impact with data is something that we struggle with. And so when we think about who we are going to be granting during this 
period of crisis as well as afterwards, I encourage all foundations to understand and to collect and to work with their grantees to collect data. If we want to be sure that we're actually meeting and responding equitably, one of the only ways we're going to be able to tell that story later on is by having access to the information that in tangible ways tells us that's what we did. And so evaluation may not be something that people want to think about right now in the time of um, speed and efficiency, but the reality is it is going to be important for us to understand what that means in the context of recovery, but also the impact of our work and our decisions right now. The last thing I would like to highlight is jumping on to, um, again, related to the long-term system change work, is that something we need to recognize right now is that recovery will not necessarily happen in equitable ways. And in fact, Adam brought this up earlier, is that it will likely tend to reinforce inequities that existed even before this crisis began. And so knowing this, I think it's absolutely important for philanthropy to reflect and understand how it's contributed to the past inequities and how it can participate and be leaders in addressing those inequities moving forward, not as a short-term measure, but a, as a long-term goal. I also would add here is that when we think about what this means for the charitable sector, it is gonna be absolutely important to invest in the charitable sector at large, but understanding those organizations that have traditionally received much, much hundreds of thousands of dollars less than our mainstream organizations, it will be important to understand how do we think about and change the mechanisms within our organizations, both now and for the long term, to ensure that we're continuing to resource a sector that needs to be present, that needs to be visible, that needs to be able to be involved in advocating for what their own needs are. And so I go back to something you said earlier, Inez, about the resources that PFC has been um, involved with taking leadership on, is that this conversation has been emerging amongst philanthropy and foundations for some time now. And I would encourage all foundations to use this time to take on the, the difficult task, learning, the figuring out what that journey is for your foundation to be more equitable, to be more inclusive, and to be more responsive to those that need the support the most, and to use the tools that have been developed. In our work on, on DEI with both Juniper and myself, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of resources that have been created over the past number of years, both in North America and abroad that are there and have been developed to assist organizations like yourself, to assist organizations both thinking from an internal perspective, but also from an external grant making perspective of how to be better. And so I encourage each of you to take up that opportunity and I hope that this is the crisis that you need to do it. Thank you so much, Hanifa. So yeah, I, I think, uh, it's, it's, it's very important to use this as a learning opportunity and to take the time sometimes to pause, even if, you know, a, a lot of our foundations are reacting, um, but actually being pro more proactive and, and taking that pause to, to, to be able to think about, uh, you know, the, the longer term uh, impacts of what we're doing today. Uh, so last but not least, uh, Sarah, I, I'm very excited <laughs> that, um, to hear from you about your two or three uh, recommendations uh, for, for, for foundations? I think number one, foundations, and I think this has been talked about already, but foundations should be working to make sure that um, groups that are doing work on the ground, but who maybe don't have charity numbers are being matched with um, support networks so that they can access funding um, through trustees or other mechanisms. Um, like I see foundations as, the group that's supposed to be helping to build those relationships for uh, grassroots organizers who may not have those institutional relationships. Number two, acknowledge that um, 
large institutions are, are always going to be flawed in the response in a crisis. It's just impossible for them to be able to, to respond adequately. So an example is the city of Hamilton um, took weeks to set up uh, proper supports through food banks. Uh, so Disability Justice Network of Ontario, we reached out to community organizers and started to just organize our own ad hoc food bank. Um, we now have 200 volunteers. We serve 100 families a week. Some families range between having two people to eight people in their family. Uh, we've done flyer drops. We have a phone line uh, where people talk to us in multiple languages, like to request their food. And we also support, like provide menstrual products um, and hygiene products as well uh, for people in the Hamilton area who are disabled, um, queer, trans, racialized, and who are not able to leave their house because they're immunocompromised or for whatever other reason. Uh, but the city's response was so inadequate that they had actually, when they heard what we were doing, had asked us as volunteers, us as racialized people, us as young people to, to send our volunteers to drive people to isolation centers versus um, paying people EI and paying people to drive people to isolation centers and take on that risk. Uh, so over and over and over again, it's gonna be community organizers that are putting themselves on the line to, to fill gaps in the city. Um, I'm immunocompromised myself. Uh, but we started to do this because there was a need for it. And so there's no room for foundations with money to be having conversations of, well, these people don't have charity numbers. There's no room for that because at the end of the day, we're the ones that are going to be seen and treated as disposable over and over and over again. And actually, if it wasn't for resource movement and John and Bronwyn and a bunch of other people, we wouldn't be able to continue this work. We were actually pulling money from our programming money like for the Disability Justice Network. Like programming money meant for youth with disabilities. We were using that to feed people. So if it wasn't for resource movement, this wouldn't have been sustainable, but organizers will again and again make the decisions to do the thing that's needed the most. We don't adhere to bureaucracy, we don't wait. And so I think foundations have the responsibility to, to, to build the relationships that's needed to get your money out there. It's not on us to find um, trustees and do all that extra work. Um, you have the relationship and the institutions to get it done. I'm finding that in Hamilton, like, there's a lot of fake sort of adherence to bureaucracy and clout. So even now, even though we're feeding the, some of the most people out of all the services in Hamilton, we're consistently left out of conversations around the city or food share or a bunch of other nonprofits. Uh, we've applied for funding through the community foundation, hoping to hear back, but because we're not seen as legitimate, because we're youth led, because we're racialized, I just don't know what the impact of that will be. So again and again, we're just kind of relying on ourselves, doing what we can to feed the most people. But yeah, my number one takeaway for all of you is do the work to build the relationships and do the research in terms of who is filling gaps out there that you are recognizing. Because none of us are geniuses, none of us are God sent, and no matter what issue you identify, I guarantee you that somebody is doing the work to, to fill that gap. There's somebody out there. Um, so don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel, that you have to invent like a five, 10 year plan to address something. There are people out there doing it, making the resources up as they go along. So please, please do the work um, to, to, to find and identify the, those people. That's all I really have to say. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your insights and perspective. Um, I think we will uh, go ahead and take some, take some time for questions now. Uh, just a reminder, perhaps, to type your questions into the Q&A uh, box in your control panel. And um, Jean-Cyl, it's over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Ines. Um, can everyone hear me? I know that's the traditional question, um, but I think that works. There, I see smiles from the panelists. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, merci de nous rejoindre uh, d'un océan à un autre. Uh, I saw that the registrations, we have folks from provinces and territories. That's really exciting. Um, just a bit of background on myself. I'm actually from the community sector. It's my first month at PFC as their communications and policy director. And I'm so excited to be able to collaborate with our wonderful panelists and my lovely colleague Ines on this um, webinar. Uh, 
we've been getting a bunch of questions on the chat boxes, but also in the Q&A sections. And um, what I want to first say is that we're getting a lot of suggestions or listings of Indigenous organizations. I wanted to mention that I'm currently working with Shireen from The Circle, who's a participant who's listening in on this right now. Hi, Shireen. We're working on a webinar that's going to be presented on May 20th on a philanthropy and Indigenous perspectives. So hold your hold your horses and get ready for that one because it's going to be fun. Um, there are questions on Indigenous fundraising that have been asked, or Indigenous philanthropy, pardon me, that have been asked uh, today, but we might uh, um, address those on the 20th. But if some of our panelists want to touch on those topics, I'll bring back that question at the end. But I'll start with one, sorry, I'm just scrolling through. Um, considering that foundations have rules and regulations to adhere to maintain status, what do foundations need to do more of to earn trust and become more flexible. Hanifa, I saw you on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think Sarah pointed out a really important point that I'm gonna add on to, but I just wanna bring it back to that first is, um, foundations need to do the work in terms of learning about and investigating into what is happening on the ground. Um, I think it's a, a bit about power, that foundations in our, are in a position of both resources and power, and so leveraging that to access information is um, important. But I understand that that's not enough. It's about how do we get the money from foundation A to organization that's unincorporated B on the ground. And so there are some challenges and technicalities that need to be addressed in that respect. An example I can sort of refer back to um, as my um, as being part of the Laidlaw Foundation, um, investing in unincorporated group has been regular business for the Laidlaw Foundation for about a decade now, if not longer. And so there are peers in the philanthropic sector who have the experience and have grappled with the questions that I'm sure many foundations who are interested in investing in the grassroots movements are having right now. And so my first recommendation is to go to your peers to understand how folks have been doing this so far. A second is to, and to this is to John's point and to the point around understanding the community and what the resources look like is um, connect with intermediaries who have strong trusting relationships with community. Intermediaries are often a way that organizations can both access resources, but they're also a mechanism that can be leveraged by funders to be able to move money from funders like foundations to community and grassroots groups. Intermediaries also play an important role in supporting grassroots groups and doing grassroots work and not getting burdened with the business of administration. So those are some of the suggestions I would have. I also just want to highlight that PLAB and PFC are doing work um, to create resources for foundations to take advantage of figuring out how to build these relationships and build their institutional mechanisms to be able to fund unincorporated and grassroots groups. Thanks, Hanifa. Um, I'm here, I'm seeing nods. Um, does anyone want to say anything to that question as well? Oh, Sarah? Yeah, go for it. I think that Another, well, this, this might be controversial, but we're at the end anyway. Uh, so politicians in Hamilton, a couple, have been redistributing their personal wealth. Like, that's something to consider, too. Is the end goal here to just move money for the sake of reports? Or, like, in crisis, are some of the people in this conversation right now with a mass amount of personal wealth willing to redistribute that at times where it's needed and that's also how you build trust because people know they can turn to you um, to invest in the work that they're doing um, and that's happening right now um, organically um, people are making the decision to say hey I'm privileged of working from home I have a good amount of wealth um, I'm going to donate monthly that's a conversation starter as well mm -hmm. most definitely um, another question are we ready for one um, here we go. So what about, really quick, oh, oh, so for it, <laughs> just, I mean, super, just really want to like affirm uh, um, Sarah's point and, and point out Bronwyn from Resource Movement shared in the chat already um, a list of 
uh, grassroots groups that are responding to COVID-19 that resource movement has been using to direct our members and our wider, wider community in redistribution. Um, and then I, I want to just quickly come back to this point around actually these interconnected points around the need for foundations to do the work um, of understanding grassroots communities needs and and also uh, the role of intermediaries because I, I think a really important and exciting place where those two things converge is that you know often a question is what, what does doing the work look like and and there's an opportunity for foundations to do the work of learning about grassroots communities by funding intermediaries and so do that learning uh, through that experience, do it while moving money versus trying to do it before moving money and having it become a barrier to moving the money. And I have to say that from, from the community sector that I was in, I did 10 years of work in the HIV uh, LGBTQ sector. Um, sometimes there's this huge disconnect and not understanding of the whole buy in for us. So I really echo a lot of what the panelists have said in terms of having a huge need for people that are of marginalized populations participate, participating in the decision making. Um, and I think it somewhat segues, but not really, to one of the questions that we received on best practices. Um, so what about the sharing of smart or best practices with those organizations that assist those that are dis disproportionately impacted by COVID-19? Sharing knowledge, funding, uh, implementing digital transformation measures, uh, board member stakeholder engagement. I just realized that there is no end of the question. So what do we think about sharing best practices? <laughs> Go for it, Adam. Um, I think that's a, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, I think it, that it depends on how uh, you go about that. Um, obviously, uh, you know, toolkits for best practices are, are could be very, very uh, useful and generative. Um, but going back to the point that I brought up about um, DEI being more than just about numbers, we need to um, take into account um, who's, uh, who's, who's defining what best practices are. Whose knowledges are we are we privileging when we come up with uh, you know these toolkits for for best practices, right? So if we're simply taking the the types of like strategies and priorities and and tools and skills that uh, are coming from elite philanthropy, and we're uh, sort of putting that down onto the community organizations and expecting them to to live up to those or to, to fulfill those sorts of priorities and, and produce those sorts of metrics that could be very, very harmful that could produce. Um, so, so we need to be really, really careful about uh, the types of power relations that are, are produced through um, something that seems as, as um, um, you know, something that seems like simple and, and necessarily good as, as, as best practices, but there's always sort of uh, the potential for uh, um, unequal power relations that can be very, very harmful. We have an interesting question that popped in um, regarding peripheral organizations or businesses. What can insurance companies or even Statistics Canada offer? And I know there was a bit, um, a few comments on data collection. So if uh, anyone wants to comment on what can peripheral organizations offer? Sarah? I think yeah. that like supporting these movements doesn't just always look like handing a lot of cash out. Um, think about the resources that you have at your disposal and how that could contribute back to the work that's being done. So I know it's not Stats Canada, but for example, um, a local church just handed us their keys because we were having trouble with finding a space. They just gave us their keys and a $1 lease and said, here, the space is yours indefinitely. Um, so things like that. What do you have that you're able to give out? So if people are calling for um, a way to collect race-based data as it relates to COVID-19. How can, like, for example, people who work for Stats can work with grassroots organizers who want to collect the data but maybe don't have the infrastructure? So think about, rather than waiting for people to tell you how you could be useful, think about the resources that you do have, even if it's not money, and then connect back. Because it, it saves a lot of, of time if you actually know what you're able to give um, back to community. We do have a question on uh, resources available, if, if anyone has them here. Can anyone tell me what are existing programs that are offering services for uh, LGBTQ2 spirit individuals, more specifically mental health counseling services uh, that use a trauma-informed lens? And I think we can also expand that question in terms of, do we know of services uh, that use a trauma-informed lens? Um, nope. We, oh. 
Yes, there are services that do exist. Um, I'm familiar with a few, but they're specific to um, Quebec and Montreal. Um, I can send the resources in an email to you, Meg Rahi. <laughs> Um, and we have one more question that I think I can take before we take Hello, closing. Sue. Oh, yeah. Sorry, can I jump in there? Um, I also am in, um, involved with the social service movement related to mental health as it relates to COVID at this point in time. So if it's Toronto specific, then feel free to reach out to me directly. Or I can get your email from Jean Seal and respond to you um, offline. And what we're going to do is, um, as Inez mentioned at the beginning, we not only share the video, the YouTube link to this um, webinar, we also are going to send a list of resources as well. So we can add a couple of resources to that. Um, and I know I'm looking at the time and there's not that much time left, but I want to give uh, time for folks to give their closing statements. So I'm just going to toss it back to Inez. I know this was a quick Q&A period and people have other stuff to do, but this is such a passionate and important discussion and I'm really grateful to be able to have participated and get to meet or get to e-meet um, our panelists. Uh, I'm gonna mute myself and hide my video and send it back to Ines. <laughs> <laughs> and and this, this conversation and the, the types of questions and the number of questions also show how important this conversation is and that um, this should be uh, just a start. Um, so, any final thoughts from the panelists, perhaps um, raise your hand if you want to share with us some final thoughts b before we, we wrap up. John. Um, I guess I want to share three quick thoughts. First of all, um, I, I want to share that I know for me and maybe for other people who are, who are like participating in this webinar, um, guilt can be an emotion that comes up when we engage with the ways in which our, our efforts are inadequate despite the privilege that we have. And that's a really natural thing that comes up. Um, and uh, I feel like I just want to invite all of us to, to anchor in, you know, like experiencing that guilt, welcoming it, but then ultimately really working to move through it and not, and not be paralyzed by it and, and just taking whatever action that we can. Um, and, and I think that that means, you know, for foundations, getting excited about taking real risks together to leverage that privilege and that, and that comfort, and, and hopefully getting excited about working long term towards abolishing uh, the settler created version of our sector um, in order to make space for communities to determine their own, their own needs and, and meet them. Um, and then for, for individual people with wealth or even relative wealth, I really want to come back to Sarah's point um, that, you know, we should not be uh, contenting ourselves to just redistribute through institutional channels like foundations. We need to be pushing ourselves beyond our comfort zone um, and we need to be re redistributing personal resources also right now. And, and again, resource movement has resources available. There's the list of, of route response funds and there'll be a, a campaign coming up uh, with, with the hashtag share my check um, to hopefully support all of us in doing that more. Thank you, John, uh, for sharing your final thoughts. Sarah? Anything to add to before we wrap up? Um, I think the other thing I would say that I maybe didn't come up as much is learn about the impacts that COVID is having on community groups that you're not a part of. Uh, it's your responsibility to be aware of that and do that work. Um, whether it's like the triage protocol that was a direct harm to people with disabilities or what's going on with the long-term care houses, um, housing situation, or politically what's going on with CERB and the ways in which it keeps changing because all of these issues are going to be worse when the pandemic dies down. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we're training up um, and being responsive to the needs that come up after the pandemic. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Hanifa. So I think uh, for me, what I would like folks to take back and take away from this conversation relates back to taking action um, and now. And so what I would say to all of those who are listening today is that um, move and move quickly and know that this is something that uh, our sector, the philanthropic sector, um, has the resources and capacity to do. And within that, to explore how all of the levers that your institution has to make change are addressed. And so whether it's through your 
impact investment strategy or through your grant making um, and decision making programs to your mission and mandate. Understand how each of those play a fundamental role in, in shaping and moving forward. The second thing I would add is I hope that foundations use this as an opportunity to let go of practices that have been harmful for organizations both led and working to support the needs of marginalized and equity seeking organ individuals. And so this idea of doing away with practices that either eliminate or disqualify organizations who are doing amazing work needs to be further explored and let go. This idea of doing um, funding agreements that are for one year instead of five years in terms of understanding that community resources and needs will not go away in one year. It's it's longer than that and we need to do better at supporting our organizations to be able to actually move forward in that change. Um, another example could be around um, how you accept and distribute resources. We've heard a few times in this call that involving those um, in decision making, sharing your power with those who should and need to be informing your decision making is instrumental to moving forward. So again, I think for me, this is really a call to action to moving and to moving forward with equity in mind and to, to letting go of what traditionally has been quite harmful for those groups that are affected by COVID this time around and will continue to be affected moving forward. Thank you so much, Anifa. So I guess the, 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 the word is act fast, but with intention and rely on the existing structures and great things that are going on uh, on the ground and, and, and just support them instead of you know reinventing the wheel and uh, and uh. so Adam um, any final words before we wrap up and uh, finish this webinar yeah I just wanted to mention uh, one thing um, I think it's important that uh, we sort of treat this uh, as a as a lesson in preparing for how we organize around future crises um, you know philanthropy is is going to or the 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 philanthropic sector, the charitable sector is gonna play a key role in fighting the climate crisis, uh, for example. Uh, and again, the climate crisis will not be a great equalizer, right? It will be a mirror that reflects and magnifies the inequities that already exist in society. Um, you know, same thing with uh, AI and automation, same thing with crises and capitalism because capitalism is always moving towards the next crisis. So it's really, really important uh, that we take these the lessons that uh, we're talking about now. Uh, you can call it a DEI lens, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and think about it as you, uh, as you retool and, and come up with new strategies for uh, uh, preparing for future crises uh, when this one is, is over. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all of the panelists. Um, one thing that uh, um, this conversation has inspired me to is um, coming from international development, um, you know, the sort of humanitarian response versus sustainable um, uh, development or sustainable agriculture and the fact that these two worlds um, in international cooperation do not speak to each other that much. And I think it's important that, you know, while we are reacting um, in the short term, we also think about the longer term implications of what we're doing today. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, I see maybe John has something to say. Okay, John. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I, um, I just wanted to remind you that you will have um, receive in your inbox uh, a follow-up email with a little short survey. Please take this couple of minutes to uh, complete it. It's very useful for us. Um, and also, if you want to get in touch with any of our panelists, uh, we are happy to share with you, um, you know, their contacts. I know you have questions that are more targeted towards one panelist, uh, etc. Um, and I also invite you to uh, sign up for our weekly digest uh, to know about, uh, you know, upcoming webinars, um, the resources that we're developing uh, right now. Um, and uh, I, I really, really thank you. I, I think it's one of our most popular webinar and I'm, I'm 
I'm thinking that, you know, we really need to continue this conversation um, and um, to, to, to highlight, you know, the, the, the need for a diverse equity and inclusion lens in philanthropy. Uh, but as Adam said, you can call it whatever you want as long as, you know, you really uh, take into account uh, um, a multi-perspective uh, approach to, 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 this, uh, to these issues. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, jean Ciel, also for uh, uh, co-moderating with me. It was our first webinar together. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.